Matthew 15, verse 20. Let me, let me say this before I read. Um, you know, what we've focused on, and I'm thankful for the heart of your pastor, for souls, <clears throat> but not just souls, for the church, for families. Um, you know, a daddy has the potential to be a better daddy if he's saved. A mama has the potential to be a better mama if she's saved. And the hope of our nation is in the church and the fulfilling of the Great Commission. There's an election coming up, and I would encourage you all to vote. Um, vote as many times as you can. And, uh, you know, whatever it takes, you know, that seems to be the thing today. But, uh, um, and you should do that. Um, but reaching people with the gospel and seeing Christians grow and becoming what they can be for Christ that's the answer. Righteousness exalts a nation. And uh, I trust that uh, we'll work together and uh, see people saved in our cities and our towns and, and the Lord do a great thing. Now, verse 29, Matthew 15. And Jesus departed from thence and came nigh into the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others. And cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. We're going to look at several things in this passage of Scripture, but I want to draw your attention to verse number 29. And Jesus departed from thence, and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee, went up into a mountain and sat down there. This verse, if, you, if you're just reading through this chapter, it's a little bit of a transitional verse as the Lord is in His earthly ministry, and it just tells us what happened. He sat down. He rested. He took a load off, if you will. He went apart and he sat down and maybe just took a deep breath, let the air, the wind, just on a beautiful day. just seems like he sat down. We know what happened after that. But I don't want us to miss that phrase and sat down there. Tonight I want to preach a message I've entitled, He's Still Sitting on the Mountain. He's Still Sitting on the Mountain. Father, we need you. Spirit of God, we must have you. Speak to our hearts, use your word. May it bear witness with each and every believer. And Father, may we allow the Spirit of God to work in our heart tonight. If there's one unsaved, may they realize tonight that Jesus is the only way to heaven. We must put our faith, our complete faith in Him. But Father, may our hearts be stirred to get people to the Son of God. May our hearts be stirred and convicted to do more for the cause of seeing people saved and uh, seeing your church advance. And uh, may the Spirit of God work in each and every heart tonight. May we be challenged to bring more people to your Son. We thank you for your love for us and the fact that you did love us enough to send your Son to pay our sin debt. And Father, may you bless this service this evening, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to think with me just for a moment. Our Lord is in His earthly ministry. And we know that Jesus went forth teaching and preaching and performing miracles. And, but when I think about that and I try and put myself in the, the time of the Scripture and what it must have been like to live in this day, or if we could go back and take a peek into what took place. We do get some insight because the Scripture gives us some insight, but even the Bible tells us that there's no way we could know all the miracles that Christ did. The world couldn't contain them if they were written down. But we do know enough about His miracles to learn from them and to see the heart of our Savior. And He was in His earthly ministry, and He was traveling from one place to the other, and he had just performed some miracles, and uh, he comes to a mountain. And if you've I've been to Israel, and some of you may have been to Israel, the, the mountains aren't like the Rocky Mountains or the Smoky Mountains. 
We would call them big hills sometimes. But the mountains around the Sea of Galilee, it says that he went up into a mountain and sat down there. If you can imagine a trail that perhaps wound through a valley, up a rocky terrain, we don't know what mountain he sat down on, but we do know he sat down there. We don't know the mind of our Lord at that time, all that was going through it. Of course, being God, He's aware of everything. But we do know what took place after He sat down there. The Bible tells us that He was not alone for long. Great multitudes came to Him. Think with me just for a moment, if you lived in this day, say, how did they get to him? If he's sitting up on a mountain, there was no uh, uh, social media post that uh, alerted everybody that Jesus was by. Right, right. Certainly people were aware of the Son of God. Yes. They were aware of the one called Jesus. Yes. Perhaps there were some in, in that city and those villages around who had heard of him but never seen him. Perhaps there were some who had seen the Lord. But regardless, the fame of Jesus spread by word of mouth. When the lame walk, that tends to get around. When the sick are made whole, that tends to get around. When Jesus did the work that he did, uh, the word would spread. And you can imagine, if you think about... The scripture and what it tells us and how he would go into a city or a village and the multitudes would come out. But Jesus did not go into this village. He didn't walk into the city. He went to the top of a mountain and just sat down. Word spread that Jesus was up in the mountain. The Bible tells us that multitudes came unto him. Yeah. Now think about it. If you and I heard that Jesus was close by, yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm leaving this service with you, yeah. right. and I'm going to go find the Lord, yeah. and I'm going to go see him, yeah. the Lord comes and he sits on a mountain, and no doubt there were those who had heard of him said, I want to go see him. Yeah. If there were some who had seen him before, said, I want to go see him again. But they didn't just, the multitudes just didn't come themselves to see the Lord. Notice the scripture very carefully. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them. Well, it's great to be in the house of God, don't you think so? It's great to be in the presence of God. It is great to go and, and see the Lord. But friend, we need a revival in our churches of having with them. We need to go to the feet of Jesus, but we need to take somebody else with us. The multitudes came unto him having with them. Who did they have with them? They had with them those that could not get to Jesus themselves. They could have hear the name of Jesus, but didn't know how to get to him. They could see the excitement as word spread about the man who spake as no man spake was close by. But they didn't know how they were going to get to him. The blind man could sense the hustle and the bustle as they sat in that place to beg. They could hear the conversations and perhaps there was somebody crying out Jesus is close by right. and they could sense the movement but not having their sight they knew they would have no way to get to the one who they've heard about yeah. Yeah. the one who they've heard testimony about yeah. can you imagine the lame man and here he is he's He's sitting in, in, in his infirmity and he can't move and he can't uh, bustle. If, if Jesus was across the street, I couldn't get to him. Much less on top of a mountain, I'm not going to be able to get to him. What a hopeless situation they find themselves in. 
But the Bible tells us that great multitudes came to Jesus and they brought with them those that could not get to Him by themselves. Imagine with me, if you would, that the word begins to spread that Jesus was up in the mountain. I imagine it like this. We know that these were brought to Jesus. Perhaps there is one who had a neighbor who he conversed with from time to time. He didn't know a lot about him, but he knew that he was blind. And he said, I've got to get my neighbor up the mountain to Jesus. Otherwise, he's not getting to him. I imagine him going to his neighbor and and saying, you've got to come with me. You've got to go with me. Well, Well, what's all the excitement about? Jesus is up on the mountain, and I've got to get you to Jesus. Well, I I don't think I can get to him. I know I'm going to help you. I'm going to take you up the mountain. Imagine somebody who who did business in the market in the town square, and and day after day or week after week, they saw the same lame man sitting and begging, and now they had heard that Jesus was on the mountain. And they rushed to that town square and they said, Sir, you've got to go with me. And and I don't even know your name. And we don't know each other, but I've passed by here many times. And I've got to get you up the mountain to Jesus. Well, 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 perhaps the word spread and there were those that that were sick with disease and, and they had no way to get to the mountain. And they heard maybe somebody told them, Jesus is on the mountain. I think Jesus can help you. Well, how am I going to get there? Well, I think we live in a world today. There's many who've heard the name of Jesus. And Jesus is available to them. They need somebody to take them up the mountain to Jesus. I imagine there were some that heard of Jesus and they... They knew what Jesus had done in their life, perhaps. They knew what Jesus had done in the life of a friend and family, and they would just go to house to house and say, the time is short, Jesus is on the mountain. If you don't act now, if you don't come now, the time is going to be too late. The, the opportunity is going to pass by. I, well, well, I don't know if I can get there. Let me help you get to Jesus. Sadly, there were probably some who were blind, lame, maimed, who were just unwilling to believe that they could ever be healed. I'm too, I'm too afflicted for it to make a difference. I'm too diseased to make a difference. Oh, can you imagine this one who knew who Jesus was? Could you imagine the tear begin to form in the corner of their eye as they pled with this one and says, You don't understand. You're not too sick. You're not too diseased. Oh, I've seen what the Lord could do. And maybe there was one who could testify and say, You've had to believe me. You, you look at me now. But I used to sit in the dust, in the the thoroughfare of the market myself. But one day he came by, and he healed me, and he made me whole. You're not too diseased. You're not too far gone. Let me take you up the mountain to Jesus. I imagine that as they begin to hike up the mountain, Having been to Israel a couple times, you understand there's a rocky terrain and and a hike is not always easy when you're by yourself. But it's much more difficult when you're guiding somebody who can't see. Your steps are much more measured. It's an extra burden. And as you climb the mountain and the air gets a little bit thinner how difficult it would be to 
have a lame man on your back. And how your the obstacles that are in front of you and the the compassion that it would take for an individual to stop everything they're doing. To even put themselves in jeopardy. To put everything on hold. To get a blind man, a deaf man, a lame man, an afflicted man up the mountain. Can you imagine? Perhaps there's there's a parent that has a young child who has a that's afflicted and in his disease, and they hear the word that, that, that Jesus is on the mountain, and they gathered up that child and said, We've got to get her up the mountain. Well, they begin taking that journey up the mountain. It's hard work. Painstaking. I imagine, I picture them soaked with sweat. Perhaps they begin to pass spectators along the way. You see, not everybody was involved in getting the multitude up the mountain. I I say in that line of spectators, there were some who probably didn't believe Jesus could make a difference. There were probably some there, though, that knew Jesus could make a difference. But they just weren't going to put themselves out. That's not my daddy. That's not my spouse. That's not my child. That's not my grandchild. That's not my friend. That's not my co-worker. And sad to say, the same thing happens in our world today. And if your family is saved, you ought to praise God for that. You ought to thank God for that. And every day you ought to fall on your face and say, God, thank you so much for letting the gospel come to my home and to come to my family. But friend, not everybody's children have been up the mountain. Not everybody's spouse has been up the mountain. And there are those who just found a lame man and said, you don't know me, I don't know you, I know the one that's sitting on the mountain, and we're going on a little trip. We're going on a journey. And they would help them up the mountain while there were some who just stood by the way. See, it's easier to blog about how those that are taking people up the mountain are doing it wrong than it is to actually take somebody up the mountain. It's easier to stand over there and say, well, I don't know who that person thinks they are. Why is that former lame man carrying another lame man up the mountain to Jesus. They did not get approval to be worthy to take somebody up the mountain. I imagine there were some who said they didn't believe in easy healism. There were some who said that lame man was predestined to be lame. There were some who just make up excuses. But friend, they were just ordinary, everyday people who knew that Jesus could make a difference. They cared about their friends, their family. But I believe with the multitudes that went up there, there had to be situations of some taking some up the mountain. They didn't even know each other's name. Let me help you get up the mountain. Thankfully, there were many who ignored spectators and cared more about those who needed to go up the mountain than those who were content to just let those who were lame, dumb, deaf, and maimed die that way. Friend, I'm I'm thankful for my testimony. I'm thankful that I grew up in church. I'm thankful I grew up in a preacher's home. I'm not not upset about that. I'm thankful for that. 
I grew up in a Bible-believing, independent Baptist church, and, and I'm thankful for my heritage. I'm thankful for what I have. But friend, just because I got saved at a young age doesn't mean that, that, that God uh, just showed favor on me so that I can sit back and say, well, I don't, I don't need to take anybody else up the mountain. There's others that need to go up the mountain. And God has put us in a situation to get others to the one who made a difference in our mind. Can you imagine that scene? That line of people. What a visual. I don't think it was pretty. Except for maybe in the eyes of our God. I think there was a struggle. I think there were many times if, if people in the Bible were humanity like we are and we're humanity like they were, I think there had to be times when that individual who just said, let me help you get up, they got tired. Their legs begin to quiver a little bit under the load the sun began to beat down maybe they had to stop along the way I could imagine there were some who might have looked at that blind that, that lame, that disease and say I've got nothing left this is as far as I can go as they both begin to stop in despair Somebody came alongside of them and said, let me help you get up the mountain. Let me help you get to our Lord. Imagine with me as they wandered up that trail and they, I picture them rounding a bend and they get to the top. You know that feeling when you get to the end? You get to where you're going and the struggle and the labor and you get there, and I believe there's a big sigh as they get up on the mountain, and they've just heard Jesus is there. Some of them have never seen Jesus. I'd say the majority have never seen Jesus. So they get to the top. They don't know where he's at, and they begin to scan with those eyes and surra- the surroundings on top of that mountain. And there on their shoulders was the weight of the individual that they had decided to take up the mountain to the Lord. They were burdened with the weight of that neighbor, that friend, but then all of a sudden they straightened up suddenly. That chest that was heaving as their lungs tried to fill with oxygen suddenly were filled. The strength expended on the journey was replenished as their eyes fixed on the one to whom they looked there he is there's the son of God there's Jesus I tell you there was no more complaining when they got to the top of the mountain I think there was some it was worth the trouble to get up the mountain as they saw the one to whom they looked there is Jesus and with all the remaining strength they had and with gentleness they coached the blind Can you imagine that blind man saying, what do you see? What do you see? Is he up here? Oh, he's he's right in front of us. Just a few more steps. Just a little bit further. Can you imagine as they guided that blind man and put him right in front of the Lord? I said, he's right in front of you. Can you imagine as they took that Lame and those afflicted and those diseased. And the Bible says they cast them down at Jesus' feet. Boy, this is so key. They did everything they could do to take them to where the one who could do something for them. Boy, and that takes me, and I'll just make a few points tonight and we'll be done. But let me first of all say, When it comes to getting people up the mountain, it comes to the lame man, it comes to the blind, it comes to the diseased. 
They didn't have to heal them. They just had to get them to Jesus. And friend, let me take some pressure off of you. You don't have to save Florence, Kentucky. You've just got to get Florence, Kentucky to Jesus. You don't have to save your, your, your family member. You don't have to save your neighbors. You don't even have to put them under conviction. You've just got to take them to the one who can save them. The one who can heal them. The one who can change their life. And I think sometimes we think, i got to get them up the mountain and then i got to make the difference. No, friend, I don't have to change anybody's heart. I don't have to save anybody because I am incapable of that. I cannot heal a lame man. I cannot heal a blind man. But let me tell you what this man can do. I can help somebody get up the mountain and I can cast them at Jesus' feet. I can't save them. I can't heal them. I can't do the miracle in their life. But I can sure put somebody on my back and say, let's go see Jesus. I can't change you. I would if I could. If I could give you sight, I would give it to you. But I can't. If I could give you a strength in those legs, I would give it to you, but I can't. But let me tell you what I can do. I can labor up that mountain. I can guide you up that mountain. And then when I place you at Jesus' feet, I've done all that I can do. I've done all that I'm capable of. They didn't have to heal them. They just had to cast them at His feet. We make the Great Commission harder than it is. We make reaching people harder than it is. It's simple. We just got to get people up the mountain. We just got to get them to Jesus. As we look into the story, we see that they didn't have to heal them. They just had to get them to Jesus. You know, can, can, do you have to have a, did they have to have a theological degree to get somebody up the mountain? Did they have to have an approval by a certain group to get somebody up the mountain? Did they have to have the talent that somebody else had? Did they have to have any talent at all to get somebody up the mountain? No, they just had to care. They just had to believe that the one on the mountain could make a difference. And sometimes I wonder, as believers, do we really believe Jesus can still save sinners? Do we really believe that Jesus can still do miracles? Well, if that's the case, church... We just got to get people up the mountain to Jesus. That's all this is this week is an emphasis that he's still sitting on the mountain. All we've got to do, it don't matter how good you sing, how bad you sing. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved or what God saves you out of. The one who does the work is still sitting on the mountain. And we just got to care enough to find the blind man and say, let's go see Jesus. Let's find a lame man and let's go see Jesus. Let's find an afflicted person and say, let's go see Jesus. And once they did that, notice what took place. And cast them down at Jesus' feet and he healed them. He healed all of them. Every one of them. Insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw. Simply, number two, they were amazed at what Jesus could do. Boy, think about this with me. Think about that blind man, that blind woman, that blind child who was led up that mountain. We're almost there. We're almost there. Oh, I see him. Can you get me close? I'm going to take you right to him. Can you imagine as they brought them to the feet of Jesus, the blind, having trusted that individual to get them to the one who could do what nobody else could do. Them being in darkness. But then they hear a voice. It's unlike any voice they've ever heard. There's something different about that voice. It's 
It's a combination of power, authority, so much compassion. All combined into one. Then they feel a touch. Touch like they've never felt before. Friend, I cannot imagine going my lifetime without seeing. But could you imagine being brought up the mountain and placed at the feet of the one that you've heard about? The one that you never knew, you'd never see. The one you never knew, you'd never have contact with because you, you're blind, you're afflicted. There's, there's no way you could ever find him on your own. But yet now, by some miracle, somebody cared enough when Jesus came by to get you up the mountain and get you to the place where the one who could do something. And there's a voice that you, you've never heard before and a touch you've never felt before. And all of a sudden, the darkness turns to light. And the first face you ever see is the face of the precious Son of God. The first face you ever see is the one who came from heaven, born of a virgin, with a purpose to die for the sins of men. Could you imagine the first voice? They see him, but they can't hear him. The first voice they ever hear is the voice of Jesus. Can you imagine as that lame individual was taken and placed at the feet of Jesus? I don't know how Jesus did it. We know he could just speak and it's done. But I imagine the precious Son of God extended that hand who soon would be nailed to a cross. He extended that hand and grasped the hand of a man who's never walked before. Of someone who's never had strength in their legs. Who's never been able to steady themselves. And they grab that hand and as he helps him begin to stand. The way I picture it is, boy, what a surreal moment when they're up on their own two feet and I imagine they've got the hand of Jesus but yet they look down at those feet and they're working. And then they turn and look into the face of Jesus. Could you imagine the joy that would be in their eyes? Can you imagine the excitement that must have filled their heart? It's so surreal. They, they can't even grasp what is taking place because they've been without hope. They've been, they, they've, been, they've, been, they've been in sorrow. But now, they can stand. Oh, as we read the Scripture, when they saw the dumb to speak, the, the maimed to behold, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, look at verse 31, look what happened. And they glorified the God of Israel. Let me just get ahead of it a little bit. The church that does the most praising is the one that sees the most people go up the mountain. There's not a greater time to praise our Lord than to see somebody go up the mountain. It says, when they saw the miracles, they glorified God. Can you imagine what took place in verse 31? I think this was a real praise and worship service. Now you got those who've never spoke before, now they're speaking. Those who've never heard before, now they're hearing. Those who've never walked before, they're taking a lap. The maimed, those that with those 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 deformities and those infirmities, they're looking over their new body as 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 parts of their body that's never walked before are now working. All of a sudden, what takes place is the only thing that can take place. It's just praise and glory to the Son of God. The Bible says they saw. So who was doing the praising? But can you imagine? I think a 
blind man who's never seen would praise God if they could now see. I think a lame man who's never walked, it was a natural reaction to praise the one who performed the miracle so they could walk. The one who's never been able to utter words and, and their mind may not have worked well enough to, to articulate his sentence, now they are praising the Son of God. But I don't think they're the only ones who is praising God. Boy, I picture this as that mountainside was, was full with those thousands of people and you got a blind man rejoicing, you got a lame man rejoicing, and then all of a sudden there's a shout from the back of the crowd. There's a hand that goes up and begins to praise Jesus. Well, who is that that's praising back there? Oh, that's the grandmama who guided her little granddaughter by the hand up the mountain to Jesus. Who's that shouting back there and praising God back there? Oh, that's a man who put a lame man on his back. He stopped everything he was doing to take the opportunity to get this man up the mountain to Jesus. And he began to praise God. Friend, let me tell you, when somebody comes to the Lord and they have their eternity changed, there's praise that goes into that. But let me tell you who else praises. Let me tell you who else rejoices. That's the one who put in the effort to get them to the feet of Jesus. That's the one who labored in prayer and labored in, 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 in those discussions of, you've got to go see Jesus before it's too late. Friend, let me help you with something if... You just can't find praise in your heart. Let me solve that problem for you. You go out here, you find you a blind man and take him up the mountain to Jesus. You find you a lame man and take him up the mountain to Jesus. You take one of those afflicted to Jesus. And we look and we're so guilty of this. We, we complain about the condition of this world. But yet Jesus is still sitting on the mountain. He's still saving sinners. He's still changing homes. He's still changing eternities. Way to put praise in your heart. They glorified God when they saw the miracles. The last truth I want to pull out of this is a powerful truth. Already, what a miracle. And I believe the Lord was there long enough to heal everybody that was brought to him. There's a whole other point there that maybe I'll add in the future. I wonder what blind man was left in town. If somebody had cared enough to get him up the mountain, Jesus would have still been there. I wonder what lame man was still in town who either would refuse to go or nobody bothered well, they, they're not going to want to go with me. They're not going to trust me. They're not, going to, they're not going to believe me. They'll probably turn back halfway up. Jesus stayed and healed everybody that was brought to him. And friend, the application is obvious. Anybody that's brought to the feet of Jesus... Who desires for salvation he'll heal them but as this has taken place in the hours that it took to get up the mountain the time that it took to see all of these miracles take place look at verse 32 with me and Jesus called his disciples unto him and said I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting unless they faint in the way. We had the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000. Our Lord was so in tune with the needs of everyone. That when word began to spread that Jesus was on the mountain, 
There were those who put their dreams aside. There were those who put their livelihood aside. There were those who put the things that were so important in their schedule aside. They said, I've got to get somebody up the mountain to Jesus. Jesus, having compassion, said, they have not eaten. He said, tell them to sit down. Might I say number four, those who brought others to Jesus had their needs met? Emmanuel Baptist Church, if you want to see a miracle for you, take somebody up the mountain. If you want to see God, if you have needs, so many times we use the excuse, well, I've got to get things, God needs to do these things for me before I can get somebody else to Jesus. And this story is a great illustration of how Jesus went to sit on the mountain. We need to take those to Him who need to be healed, and then He'll take care of our needs. The people that day, they learned an important lesson that the Son of God is able and capable of healing anybody who needs to be healed. But they also learn that for their own needs to be met, their own desires to be met, that God cares enough about them that He'll meet their needs as well. God is not doing miracles for self-centered churches. God is not doing miracles for self-centered Christians. Friend, might I remind you today that he's still sitting on the mountain. We can complain about it's sad. The people are blind. It's sad. The people are lame. And it's sad that there's all these problems in our world. Or we can just be busy taking people up the mountain to the one who can do something about it. We're too busy trying to figure out how to see everybody healed and Jesus is still sitting on the mountain and as long as we'll bring people to him, he'll heal them. Now I didn't mention this, but I can only imagine there was somebody who took somebody up the mountain and said, I'm going to see if I got time to go get somebody else. And I'm going to get them back up the mountain. And while others were, were on the sidelines, they were going back and forth doing everything they could do. Is he still up there? He's still up here. I'll be right back. Church, he's still sitting on the mountain. Eventually, Jesus got up and left the area. The opportunity had passed to get someone up the mountain. I wonder if there were any diseased who died shortly after. That's tragic in itself. so much more tragic than the one who could have changed it. If somebody had just said, let me help you get to the mountain. Maybe there were some who died shortly after who refused to go. That's not anything that we can do anything about. But I, I wonder if there were some at first who were hesitant. But yet that friend, that family member, maybe in some circumstances a stranger, knelt down on their knees, looked at them eyeball to eyeball, and pleaded with them. Please let me take you up the mountain. Please let me take you to the one 
Let me tell you what it did for me. Let me tell you what it'll do for you. And maybe there was somebody, it was the compassion, it was the care, it was the tears, it was the pleading, it was the heart-wrenching, sincere plea from somebody they may not have known or somebody who lived next to them. Maybe it was that compassion that convinced them, okay, I'll let you take me up the mountain. And friends, sometimes it takes that. It takes the compassion and the care that if you don't get up the mountain, one day Jesus is going to pass by. And the time's going to be too late, and, and the opportunity's going to be over. And friend, I say to you, in Florence, Kentucky, he's still sitting on the mountain. And we just got to get them to the feet of Jesus. Well, he took a lot of pressure off of me as a young preacher in ministry when I was reminded I don't have to change a heart. It's not my job to convict anybody. It's just my job to care enough to take somebody up the mountain. I conclude and close with this. Are there any blind that work in your office? Are there any crippled that live in your neighborhood? Are there any diseased that share your last name? I'm afraid we get, we get to a place in our Christian life when we are upset at a blind man for being blind. Almost as if it's their own fault. And we have forgotten by the grace of God what He's done for us. Who do you know needs to be taken up the mountain I think Jesus can still do miracles I think he can still heal those that need to be healed somebody's got to care enough somebody's got to be dedicated enough and, and I know what the excuses are, and we can call them valid excuses, but they're still excuses. I don't have the strength to put somebody on my back. Well, go find you somebody to help you. Get them up the mountain. Well, they just won't go. Why don't you fast and pray and say, with, with God, would you change something in their heart? But who works with you? That unless you take them up the mountain, they're not getting there. Who lives on your street? Who do you drive by every day? Aren't you thankful for the house of God? Aren't you thankful for God's goodness? But friend, may this weigh heavy on us that unless we do our part, and getting somebody to the feet of Jesus. We don't have to heal them. We can't heal them. We don't have to save them. We are incapable of saving them. But we can get them to the feet of Jesus. It's going to take compassion. It's going to take dedication. It's going to take sacrifice. But aren't you glad somebody carried you to the feet of Jesus? Oh, let us not forget. We bow our heads tonight. I want us to think and consider the question that I've already posed. I'll go back to Monday night. For those of you that were here for Monday night, you have the opportunity by having part of the Great Commission to do what the majority of Christians never do in their lifetime. Friend, I want you to think just for a moment. 
Figuratively speaking, if Jesus were to stand up and that opportunity were to pass, who's going to die in their trespasses? Who's going to perish? I, I, I know there are some who want to have nothing to do with what we're saying. But friend, I, I am convinced that we still live in a day where there's somebody... If, if somebody generally cared enough about them and their condition, they would let them take them to the feet of Jesus. And friend, this is just me. It may not be you. I don't have time to argue with somebody about the validity of going up and down the mountain when there are people who just need to be taken up the mountain to Jesus. But friend, who do you know? May tonight, may God burden our hearts. There might be somebody after you leave the service, there might be somebody you need to call on the phone. And say, we've got to talk. I've got to tell you about the one who can change your eternity. You might need to have a sit down with somebody you love or a co-worker, find some time to talk to them and plead with them to let you take them to the feet of Jesus. From that day that we read of this account to this, the Lord has never turned away. Someone who wanted His healing touch. Friend, this evening... May we be concerned and may we dedicate ourselves to just taking people up the mountain. Preacher. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.